Well, hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Gloria Washington, and I will be the host and moderator for this ideal conference session. If possible, please turn your camera on so that the presenters can see you. Please make sure your mic is muted to minimize background noise. If you would like to offer nonverbal feedback, for example, thumbs up, clapping, heart, you can use the Zoom reactions. There will be a time at the end of the session for question and answer. Please note that by entering this ideal session, you will acknowledge that you are aware this session will be recorded and may be posted online with the ideal content. This session will utilize the Zoom live transcription function, which produces subtitles at the bottom of your screen. Please note that the accuracy of the transcript is dependent upon a variety of factors, including background noise and the clarity and volume of the speaker's voice. Thank you for joining us for Celebrating Community, a case study in transforming online teaching perceptions and practices. Please welcome your presenters, Kern Skibble and Maria Whitmer. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, with the teaching and I'm a teaching and learning specialist at our recently opened Center for Teaching, Learning and Mentoring at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Maria. Hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here with you uh, this afternoon. I'm Maria Widmer. I use she, her pronouns, and I manage the teaching, learning and technology team for UW Madison School of Education. And I'm also a doctoral student in higher education policy there. And today we're going to be talking about, um, as the title suggests, a case study uh, where we explored the impact of a large blended faculty learning community on instructors' perceptions of and practices for online education. And so um, as we go along, uh, we'll have opportunities to, to participate and we'll also open it up for questions at the end. So feel free to add uh, questions in the chat as we go. We'll keep an eye on that. And then again, at the end, we'll, we'll have some time to debrief together. And our background is our famous uh, union background where we're by our lake and all of that. So we're pretending we're both at the lake at the union at UW-Madison right now. <laughs> That's true. It's a beautiful fall day here in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, so a quick overview of what we'll cover as we go along. Uh, we'll give a brief overview of the research design, some details about the program that we examined in this case study, an analysis of the different program elements using um, the community of inquiry framework uh, to categorize, and then a discussion of our findings. We're really just gonna hit uh, kind of the highlights for this session, but at the end, we'll provide you with a summary. Don't read this on the screen, don't worry. <laughs> um, this is just a snapshot of a summary of the data analysis um, that we'll give to you at the end in case you'd like to dig in further. Um, so as we go along, we're gonna take some pauses to do some brainstorming together so that we can benefit from the collective expertise of the folks who are on the call here today. And we're gonna be asking you to add your ideas to a Google Doc, um, which you'll be able to find via the URL that's shown on this slide. Once we get to that part of, of our time together, I'll also put a link to that document in the chat. So just a little, a little preview of that. So uh, the questions that we used to guide uh, this, this case study analysis were which methods utilized in the blended faculty learning community categorized by the presences of the community of inquiry framework had the most impact on participants' perceptions of and practices for online course design and teaching? And why were these methods impactful? We'll just touch base a little bit on the case study because I know that, that there's a lot of detail with that, but basically we conducted a mixed methods descriptive case study of a blended faculty learner community at University of Wisconsin-Madison called Teach Online at UW. So we'll share a little bit about that program later, but we used a variety of sources such as interviews with learning community, community participants, surveys asking participants to evaluate the impact of the learning community after they taught online, and analysis of the program, including a content analysis 
of examining a, a lot of online discussions in which participants share their challenges and concerns and lessons learned and strategies they plan to implement in their own courses. So Maria and I are both facilitators in this program. And I'm also the program manager and, and the founder of this learning community. So we'll share a tiny bit about it before we get into it. Right now, we've had 392 unique participants. That is because participants can participate in one or both courses. So if you add up how many times they took the courses, we had 660 enrollments. So about 60% of the people participate in both courses. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But for the SERP for the uh, research study, we did 11 in-depth interviews, but we did uh, analyze 357 surveys uh, for both the quantitative and qualitative analysis. So these are the two courses that we looked at. We had one called Plan and Design, which is uh, focusing on obviously planning and designing an online course. And also we have one called facilitation and management and you can see the topics that are listed there. But we've had cohorts from as low as 10 to over 80 participants during the pandemic period last summer. Um, and so, so we had quite a variety of people participate in this program, including deans and department chairs and uh, adjuncts from all levels of instructors participated. And in, in the next slide, we kind of show how we formatted this. We had online modules was the majority of the course where they would learn about design and facilitation practices. And they were followed by, before the pandemic, we had wonderful lunch sessions before March 2020, but that was abruptly halted after March 22, where now we just hold everything as synchronous webinars, which is what we've been doing since then. Uh, where we actually engage participants in further exploration of the content, but really they need to review the content before we meet synchronously so they have a blended learning experience. Maria. All right, so we're going to dig into the community of inquiry framework for this next section, but I want to just get a quick read of the room um, using that reaction feature in Zoom. Can you give me a a thumbs up or a heart or the celebration horn. Um, I never know what that thing is called. Uh, some kind of reaction if you are familiar with the community of inquiry framework. Okay, yeah, so we got a, a mix. Um, at this point, the framework is now about 20 years old and it's really been an important contribution to the literature on online and blended teaching. Um, so, but despite this really widespread use as a theoretical framework, its application in research on faculty development to date has been pretty limited. Um, so our study wanted to use this framework in the context of professional development in order to provide faculty developer, developers with evidence-based strategies that they could use to guide instructors through teaching transformation, knowing that that transformation is critical to student success in online education. And we care about this framework because it's been really useful for us as a support for reflection uh, in the program development itself. Um, it's helped us to be clear with ourselves about the purpose and intent for many of the strategies that we've been using in Teach Online. And at the same time, um, there's always a risk of getting lost in the details. So using this framework has helped us to step back a little bit and think about the components within the context of a kind of holistic educational experience. We'll talk about that more as we go along. But our hope is that you might be able to use it to make sense of what you're doing in your own context. Um, you might use it to think about ways that you might try something new, to check what you're missing, and uh, to check the balance between cognitive teaching and social presences, which are kind of the core elements of the framework that we will go on to discuss. So um, the coding scheme that we used for the qualitative analysis was based on these three COI presences and pedagogical elements that are listed on this slide. Uh, we're gonna dig into each of these as we go along, but each of these factors really contributes towards the development of different presences in the learning environment. So now we're gonna talk, uh, go into, into depth with each of these and briefly explain our case study findings. Over to you, Karen. Great. 
Well, first we'll talk about teaching presence. And for those of you familiar with this framework, that's everything that the instructor does to guide, support, and shape the learner's experience. This includes the design and organization of the course, the actual instruction of the course, including sharing knowledge with through diverse sources and confirming understanding through assessments and feedback. And finally, the facilitating of the discourse by encouraging participation to share ideas and set the climate for learning. So I'm gonna show you just one of the pieces and you'll have access to these uh, documents as well. So this one is the planning document. Um, oops, I guess I can't share, Maria. Um, okay, all right, good. All right, won't well, let me share otherwise. I'm just gonna quick share um, what that uh, looks like. So this is the planning worksheet and you have a, you'll have a copy version that you can make for yourself as well. And this is what we used throughout the plan and design course where they would plan actually a full module of their online course throughout that. So that was a really good one. And I'll just show the second one here and then we'll go back to the slides. And uh, the second one is the online journal. And that's what they use during the facilitation and management course throughout the entire course where they reflected on a lot of the common online teaching challenges. So I'll stop sharing here. So basically, those are the documents. And like we said, we'll share those with you. But the learning community facilitators encourage participants to share their challenges and ideas during the discussions and synchronous sessions. That was really, really important. So that's why even though the course content was the same, that every webinar session seemed very different because instructors share. This is a picture when we were able to have lunch. <laughs> we don't do that anymore, as I mentioned. But both courses are, are blended learning community because they provide a variety of expected, perspectives from online instructors, many who are past participants. They come back and talk to the group about their experiences designing and teaching an online course. And we also, in the course itself, have um, video testimonials. So we try to provide as much of instructor um, content and feedback as possible. So one of the things that we do that we feel is really important is we have for the plan and design course and the facilitation and management course, we have facilitators provide feedback and some of them are online instructors as well, provide feedback on those documents that I showed you and a lot of the other, there's a lot of optional activities they can do as well. But we feel it's some really important for the instructors to get this feedback. And as you can see from this quote, they said the thoughtful feedback on the assignments was extremely helpful, not just from a relevance point of view, but from an account accountability point of view. So that, that they knew that we were gonna be providing feedback and that encouraged them to participate in these activities. So that was a really important part of the program and always seen as really important. So now, if you can, do you have, did you paste the document in there? Good, okay. So now if you could go to that document, we would like to ask that you pop in that document once you get in there and share some of the ways that you can use teaching presence in your faculty development programming. Can all of you get in okay? So we'd just like to take a few minutes for you to type in something in the cognitive area that you think you could use. And we'll, we'll use this document throughout. So if you wanna do that later, that's fine too. But can I get a thumbs up if everybody can access that document? Everybody can? Okay, good. And this is something, this document also provides the links to the PowerPoint presentation as well. So it's something that you will want. Okay, we'll move on. Maria? Okay, so moving along from our focus on teaching presence, the arrive next at social presence, which is what students and instructors do to communicate openly and purposefully in the learning environment. And so we see how relationships and this sense of group cohesion start to take shape as participants are engaging in personal communication, affective communication, and as they become more comfortable in projecting their real personalities through emotion, humor, personal self-disclosure, et cetera. Um, 
so for example, you know, just to kind of make it more specific, um, affective communication is established through humor, self-disclosure, using emojis um, or celebration symbols, other forms of emotive language. Um, and so in particular, uh, the learning community offered plenty of opportunities for congregation and free talk. So, um, you know, just sort of like open conversation, not necessarily focused on what the participants are learning in a given session. And the goal was really to support the development of collegial relationships in particular through the in-person or synchronous sessions. Um, and then in the, the online space, there was an online cafe and a share resources discussion forum. And so uh, for each of our synchronous or face-to-face -face meetings, um, when we could do this, uh, they began with a shared meal and then 15-ish minutes of informal conversation. And so at first participants were pretty intentionally placed with departmental or disciplinary colleagues. And the goal of this was really to build on existing local connections. Um, and then as the program kind of moved along, we started to mix up participants during the online group discussions so that they could be exposed to a variety of opinions and ideas. And we really, we really saw this cited by the participants as being valuable part of the program. Um, one person who we interviewed shared, I really valued meeting and getting to know people outside of my department who are similarly interested in improving teaching. And so again, we'll take a pause point. Um, if you'd like, we'll invite you to add into our shared Google Doc some ideas that uh, you might have about how you could use social presence in your own faculty development programming. I see we've already got one contribution in there. So I'll give us a couple of seconds of pause here to add in additional ideas that we might have and then we can move on. Beautiful. Okay, feel free to keep adding them in. But I'm going to keep us moving on to our third and final presence that we'll talk about within the COI framework. Let's talk about cognitive presences. This was a larger one, so I have to go into the four parts here, but this is the extent to which learners are able to construct and confer meaning through reflection and discourse. So let me talk a little bit about all of these listed here, because that was a, a difficult for one to analyze all the content through. It was the triggering event, exploration phase, integration integration phase, and resolution phase. So let me just quickly explain what each of those are, if you can go to the next slide. So the first phase is really the triggering event, and that's the recognition of a problem or issue. For Participants really came to this learning community for a number of concerns about teaching online that they were hoping to resolve. Shown on the slide is how participants were starting to plan their course rhythm something many of them never even thought about, but they found it that it totally changed how they organized their courses. So they came here for this course because they were concerned they had no idea how to teach online. So that was the main triggering event that a lot of people came. And then the next one is the exploration phase. That's where participants shared and brainstormed relevant resources and ideas. So shown here, is a Padlet where the participants shared how to help students start effectively in the course. We had lots of different ways for them to explore issues. Reflection was a really important part of this course. So this is just one opportunity and one example. And then finally was the integration phase. This is where participants connected ideas and created solutions through application activities that allowed them to create content to use directly in their own courses. So this slide shows the four options they could select from for a final project to make significant progress in the course. Later on, we added another option where they could propose one of their own so they could work on what they needed to get detail feedback. So it was really important for, for them to work on things that they could use immediately in their course. And finally, the exploration stage, that's where both courses solicited participants' challenges and concerns about teaching online in introductory and topical discussion forums. 
And we also did that during the meetings and during the webinars and all the different collaborative activities. So we constantly were asking for their challenges, concerns on various topics and talking about it from many different ways. So this is an example of we call, what we call a starting point activity that asked participants to share their prior experience before they began a module because we wanted to know what they thought of that prior to delving into the content. So here's some of the examples of the things that we, we used for cognitive presence. And that was, um, I'll let uh, Maria go into that a little bit here. Yeah, so as we go through ex triggering, exploration, integration, our final phase here is resolution. And so a few ways that the program works towards uh, supporting participants in reaching resolution are through, as Karen suggested, a choice of final project that's designed to support continued progress on the course past the program, a final lessons learned discussion, um, which allowed participants to share the ways in which their ideas and opinions about online teaching had changed and resolve towards strategies that they plan to apply in their own future courses. And then some fun uh, strategies for resolution, including a game of Jeopardy and a celebration event, um, which gave further opportunities to synthesize and integrate what they had learned. One participant who we had interviewed shared that their big takeaway from the course was an overall increased awareness of the components necessary for creating, delivering, and managing an online course. And so we reached one final opportunity for us to synthesize before we move forward. We'll take a, a few moments here to pull open the collaboration document and share how you might use cognitive presence strategies in your own faculty development programming. I would say um, in my program, I would try to get the faculty to get an opportunity to meet the students in our iStudy program, just because it's all online, so they don't really get to see them face to face. So some type of little social just to get them to put a name with the face. Hey, thanks, Justin. That's great. Anyone else have anyone to share anything to share? Okay, as always, feel free to, to take notes in the deck there as as things come to you. So we'll return again to those um, those two primary guiding research questions. Um, and Karen will share a bit about how, through the surveys, interviews, and program evaluation data, we arrived at key findings uh, in response. Right. So our first key finding was uh, supporting that the three community inquiry presences really contributed to meaningful learning experience through which instructors reconsidered their perceptions and practices of online education. It was really important that we ensured that all three of those presences were really strong in the, the learning community. The other one that we found also that was really critical is that the meta experience of being an online student and experiencing the modeling of all these presences that really impacted the participants' perceptions and practices of online education. Most participants indicated this was the, really the first time that they ever experienced being an online student. And it was really humbling and eye-opening. And we have a lot of great quotes on what they said it felt like to be an online student. And the last uh, factor that we found participants citing as being particularly influential was the blended experience, um, which really afforded sort of a mo multimodal approach to interaction and reflection. So participants first engage in online modules, which were then followed by face-to-face -face or synchronous webinar sessions. And having that direct experience in the online courses allowed instructors to be as one said, immersed and spend time ruminating on the content. So this is sort of more of an individual reflection, digging in and finding ways that it connects um, with their individual interests. 
And then at those live synchronous meetings with guidance from facilitators, participants could reflect more deeply about the student experience, about the online content and talk with others about their uh, plans about how they're gonna apply these strategies in their own courses. So in summary, it was really the holistic experience, all of this that emerges from the interaction of teaching, social and cognitive presence that supports instructors and in actually transforming their perception, perceptions of teaching and practices. It's really hard to move to that transformational learning, but by having the interaction of these three presences, they were able to transform their thinking of teaching and learning, not just for online. We found that this was the case also for all modalities. And we found that this impact was most immediately salient in March, 2022, when instruction was quickly moved to the remote format. So we'll talk a little bit about that because we actually conduct, oh, I can't talk today. We conducted our study in summer 2020, which provided an opportunity to see how the learning experience influenced instructors transitions to the emergency remote teaching. So they were still, a lot of them were still taking this program during that time. That's when we had that high number of 80 participating in the summer. And throughout those interviews, we found that instructors in um, testifying that the importance of the community and the empathy that they had built through their learning experience in the program. So we heard a lot about that importance of empathy and community. So here's a few things that we heard from them. They said that they had a more rapid and effective transition to remote teaching. Uh, actually, a lot of them were called on to support their colleagues. I kept getting emails from instructors saying, thank you. And now they're now calling on me because I'm the expert in online in my department and I just took this course. So they were being called on to help out their other instructors and colleagues. The most important one that we felt that the turning the assignments in late and contacting the instructor for extensions was what they did to us as instructors. They found that their own behaviors aligned with those of their own students. That led the participants to gain more empathy and compassion through a better understanding of online students' personal situations, concerns, and fears that was really obviously pretty pre prevalent for the COVID-19 pandemic. And we still hear that today from them. They learned firsthand what it meant to design and teach a humane and learner-centered online course. And so those were some of the applications that we found um, as our online faculty development programming has moved online during the pandemic. Um, but we wanna hear from you. Uh, we're really curious to learn how, if at all, moving online during the pandemic affected your own individual um, context, whether it's around online faculty development, instructional design initiatives, et cetera. Um, and Meg, I see you've come on camera. Would you like to, to share something? Uh, well, I think th this um, your presentation was, was tremendous. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I am not personally involved in faculty development courses per se, but of course I teach online and have for a long time. And I'm also a licensed psychologist. So I, I, it really uh, resonates with the, the empathy and, uh, and I, one thing I found was that it really leveled the kind of leveled the playing field between instructors and students because we were all experiencing the same things. You know, the stress and the uncertainty, anxiety and, you know, all of this stuff going on and then teaching from home, we were all on the same kind of um, plane. And I think that helps with empathy as well. We're much, much more collaborative. Sorry about that. Much more collaborative than hierarchical in terms of instructor and student and all this. So I think a lot of positives came out of this. And I, I also, I mean, kind of what Karen was saying, how it feels to be a student. I got a lot of that experience through taking Quality Matters courses. And it is humbling. <laughs> I submit an assignment and I haven't heard immediately back. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wonder how it's going to be rated. Is it good enough and all this kind of stuff? So th these are great experiences, but uh, I haven't, I, I, I don't think that our university has done enough of this, honestly. This, this is really tremendous. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
and we still hear from them even even though this, this started in 2005 i still hear from instructors who took the very first cohort and these lessons stay with them for all that time and they still remember that and they still make sure I get emails, oh, this is how my summer online course went, thanks to what I experienced from this course. So it's something that sticks with them because they experienced it themselves. Good, any other yeah. comments on, on that? Oh, go ahead, Maria. Karen, I would just share, you know, part of the reason why we engaged in this case study was it was a curiosity about like, well, why is that? You know, why, I think we've all, I'll speak for myself. I have certainly participated in um, professional development communities or opportunities where it's sort of a one and done, take away a couple of things. But, um, you know, I would, I would hear Karen sharing like, oh, so, you know, these participants now meet up in a group to talk about their online teaching practice. So it's, it was sort of motivated by a curiosity about like, what, okay, so what actually are the factors that are leading to this? Um, and we had a hunch, but really, really seeing how like each of these three integrated into a fairly holistic way um, was, was surprising to me at least. And so, um, and, and Megan, and, and one, thank you for sharing that reflection. I would just say um, one thing that we've heard particularly around that social presence factor is this sort of like shared trauma of the experience <laughs> of being a student. Um, and so having that kind of open time for collegial conversation and like a little bit of healthy complaining, like, oh, I, you know, I forgot to do this or like I'm, I'm swamped and I'm late again and getting in, you know, this, this journal to Karen. Um, a lot of that sort of like social cohesion, I think was particularly impactful. So what are you guys seeing though now that after the pandemic is uh, we're seeing a slowing, you know, of people participating in programs, but yet they still are participating in this program, but not the high numbers that we had before. What are you seeing with faculty development now or your instructional design initiatives after, after the pandemic remote, you know, teaching experience? Um, I think one problem they've had is that uh, they're understaffed. So, and we're all kind of overworked. There have been, you know, tightened budgets and people are retiring and the positions aren't getting filled. And that's staff, faculty, you know, everybody. So it, it's, it's, um, it's been difficult. I think those are, those are factors that made it very difficult. And I'm wondering, is, is this course required? It'd be kind of nice. No, nope. no, we don't require anything like that at UW Madison. Nope, there's no requirement. They do get a digital badge, but really what they prefer is they also get a letter to their dean and department chair. And I get a lot of positive when I send those out, uh, I get a lot of positive. So they prefer the, the letter to their dean and department chair. We used to were able to give stipends a long time ago, but that just like lunch that went out the window after March, 2022. So we didn't know if we would have participation, but that letter to their dean and department chair is, is very positive. Oh, that's Sorry, I, I saw you uh, You come off mic too. Was there something you wanted to share? Um, I was going to say, um, yeah, at our university, um, we have seen a decrease in those um, offering of our short course um, participants. Um, we offer a getting started teaching online um, program, which I facilitate. We also offer a technology for online teaching and learning, which I also um, facilitate as well. Um, we have a teaching for grad students um, that's done by um, Casey Carroll, one of our instructional designers. And then we also have what we call COPED, which is Carolina Online Teaching um, Program. And that particular program, it seems to run in line with um, the type of professional development that you guys are offering, um, where you have the blended environment. Um, and so the numbers have decreased for us, but we're still able to at least reach those who still need um, help with that online teaching. Um, but and then a lot of it, like Meg says, goes back to the fact that 
you know, we're short staffed, you know, you lost a lot of instructors, you know, who haven't returned back to either face to face or even online. Um, so in your departments also where you're short staffed, so you have people doing triple duties, so they don't have the opportunity and time to participate right now, you know, as we move hopefully away into our real new normal. Definitely. So we're grappling with that. We're, like I mentioned, I'm now part of a new center for teaching and learning. So we'll be exploring all the different opportunities of what do we offer faculty right now and not be worried that the numbers aren't as high as they used to be. It's really the impact on those instructors who participate. That's really the most important. Something like your presentation here would be great for faculty meetings as just add it to an agenda. I mean, it doesn't have, you could give a 10 minute presentation that could be very impactful and required. It's part of, you know, we have to have departmental meetings. So this, I think that could be a really good use of time. Thanks. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever require online faculty development at UW-Madison, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, not in their culture, but uh, yeah, but listen, but that's a great idea to present at department meetings, the impact and have some of the faculty because almost every department now has had somebody go through the program. So what most of the people that are signing up are referrals from faculty who have gone through the program. So that's the most powerful. Wanna summarize Maria? Yeah, sure thing. So this, this final slide here, um, we wanted to offer both an opportunity to dig a little bit more into the data. We breezed through a couple of quick instructor quotes, but um, you can find much more in this in this first link with the summary of the data analysis. Um, but we also wanted to share some of the program resources that uh, we highlighted that we have heard from participants were eff particularly effective. Um, so you can find a link to the planning worksheet, which is used in that plan and design course, um, which is sort of a, a sequence structure of activities that lead instructors through the steps of building an online course. Um, the third link here is a link to the online journal, which is a bit more of like self-reflection questions around the, the themes of facilitation and management. And then that last link is uh, a, an opportunity just to learn more about some of the details of the Teach Online at UW program. Um, and Karen, I think that these Google slides are linked in yes. our Google Doc, right? Up at the top yes, I put, the, I put it in the Google Doc. So everything you need is there. So this last slide is part of that Google Doc. Yeah, so I'll put the, uh, uh, well, my broken return key on my keyboard is not letting me hit enter. <laughs> oh no, um, I'll put it in it, for you, Maria. Okay. I feel for Thanks, you, Karen. I've had enough. Tech issues. Well, today I had wording issues. Sorry about that. <laughs> Tech <laughs> issues with that. <laughs> okay. But yeah, as, as Karen said, um, feel free to adapt and use those uh, resources for, for your own purposes. Um, so I guess we can we can just close out by saying thank you. We'll we'll hang on the line and happy to to field any questions um, that you all might have. Thank you for joining us. I know you have a lot to choose from today. So thank you for joining us. And for those who are watching the recording, let us know if you have any questions. We're always happy to chat. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your presentation. And thank you, attendees, for attending this session. And don't forget about the synchronous activities listed in the conference program. Um, we have our e-posters. We also have a conference choice course award um, competition going on, I guess, if we want to call it a competition, um, where you can watch some course um, development videos and select the conference choice video. And enjoy the rest of your ideal conference.